Welcome back to 3.5 Firefighter, the podcast where I have conversations with firefighters all around the country on all things fire service related, especially those three things that I think are the foundation for any good firefighter, pride, training, and physical fitness. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 3.5 Firefighter. Also, my contact info will be down in the description below. So this is a first for 3.5 Firefighter. Normally, I have a conversation over Zoom and never in person. Today's much different. Not only do I have somebody in person, I have nine people in person. These are all brothers that I have taught with, some I've taken classes with. These are all top-notch members and instructors for the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, the ISFSI, or even better, just call it the Society. We are all here prepping in Denver for the kickoff of our new ISFSI basement fire class. Now, if you've listened to my podcast in the past, you know I like bragging about the Society. I don't say the Society is great because I'm a member and an instructor. I'm a member and an instructor because it is great. I was so fortunate to have so many heavy hitters in one place at one time. Now, I made sure that every guest on my podcast and myself has been vaccinated. So with that, here is a whole bunch of people. So with that, I would like to maybe start with Seth and give a little introduction about who you are, what department you work with, and we'll just go around the table. I'm Seth Barker with the Big Sky Fire Department in Southwest Montana. I'm the first vice president for ISFSI, and I think I've been a member for about nine years. So I'm Kevin Milan, assistant chief with South Metro Fire here in Colorado. Been with the society about 20 years and a past board member. Hey, uh, Forrest Reeder. I'm the fire chief of Tinley Park, Illinois. Uh, again, just like Kevin said, about 20 years with the society, past board member, and uh, lucky to be part of this program. Uh, Brian Zeitz, assistant chief out in Kirkwood, uh, right outside St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, currently second vice president of the ISFSI. I'm right, Gil Joseph with the uh, Glendale Fire Department in California, fire captain. Been with the society for about five years. And Gilbert has been on the podcast before, telling me all about Southern California and how perfect it is. <laughs> Indiana and Kentucky sucks. So, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, Brad French, uh, Dayton, Ohio, fire, and uh, been doing stuff with the society for, I don't know, seven or eight years, I think, um, and past board member as well. Um, you got to say it. You got to say it. Oh, I'm TC. The BC from DC. There it is. is that what you want? <laughs> there it is. I love it. <laughs> At least for um, 25 more days. Um, and then I'll be TC, the SC from LC. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I am an at large board member for the uh, society and I've uh, been involved with uh, basement fire stuff. And this is a really good time to roll out the practical part of our basement fire. Yeah, and so uh, Tony's been on here before, and when it was set up, I, I mentioned in our conversation earlier, it was set up, I didn't know it was Tony Carroll I was talking to, it was Tony originally until we set this up, and a uh, really good conversation, and I hope everybody goes back and listens to that one, because you have a lot of experience, a lot of things have happened in your past that you like to share to hopefully have people not do the same thing. So Yeah, don't be the dumb, don't be as dumb as I am. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Next. Uh, Brian Kazmerzak, uh, Benton Harbor Department of Public Safety, Benton Harbor, Michigan. Been with the society probably 12 or 13 years and uh, past board member, helped with the PMFA program, basement fires. Okay. That leaves me. That's the last. Yeah. Save the best for last. Yeah, sure you did. Uh, Pete Van Dorp, and I'm the president of the society as it sits. And uh, I'm failing at retirement for the second time. Uh, in in uh, April of 2019, I retired from the Algonquin Lake and Hills Fire Protection District. I was assistant chief and then chief there. I had about five and a half years there. Prior to that, I was with the Chicago Fire Department for 33 years, and I retired out of there in October of 2013 um, as the chief of training. So I've been with the society since about that time when I got to be the chief of training in Chicago was when I joined the society. Um, and then, yeah, I've met all these clowns and, and um, it's, it's keeping me engaged. You know, I'm not active anymore, but it's keeping me engaged. Just let me have a hand still in the fire service for a couple more years, I hope. Now, is it safe to say you're not at all picky about other places than Chicago, certainly Chicago style pizza? <laughs> uh, it's one of my pet peeves, right? You can put I can you can put anything on a piece of dough you want, and but just don't call it pizza. 
<laughs> now you said that uh, only the uh, tourists eat the deep dish. Yeah, that's just the shit we sell to the tourists. We don't, <laughs> we don't eat that ourselves. You know, thin crust, nice crisp thin crust pizza is a real in squares, crust, right? in squares, in squares, cut in squares, right? None of that wedge shit either. That, that's that's Chicago. <laughs> if, if you shit. can fold it, if you can pick up that wedge and fold it, the dough is way too soft. You know, right then and there, you're doing it wrong. Right? You're doing it wrong. Yeah. Okay. I did not know that. Okay. I'm going to have to do a whole podcast just on pizza. Getting hungry thinking about it. Yeah. Um, so let's say you're the president of the ISFSI. Can you give me a, kind of an overview <clears throat> of what exactly you do and what the society really is? What, what I do is try to get out of the way of all these people that do all the work, quite honestly. Uh, what, the, what the society does is we, we are dedicated to supporting, elevating, encouraging fire service instructors. Right. If, if you look around, there's all kinds of support and training and education for just about every aspect of the fire service except that instructor. And we all recognize um, how important that role is. Whether, whether you're in that role or not, we all recognize how, how important it is for company officers to be effective instructors for their crews. And yet there, there's a constant lack of, of support and education and resources that's dedicated to helping that instructor be everything that he or she can be. And that's what we try to do. Now, is, this, is it a something for the established instructor? Like after you get a couple of years on the job, that's when you want to look into the ISFSI? Or is it for the brand new instructor that's like, I need to learn something. I need to be better myself. So I need to look into it. Yes. Yes, both, right? <laughs> Absolutely, right? It's also for that instructor that has been doing well, doing good for a long time. It just feels like they're running out of gas and they need a little bit of reinvigorating or recharging the batteries and that sort of thing. That's how I came into it is that, you, you know, here I am all that time with the Chicago Fire Department, and then I'm suddenly anointed chief of training, and I realized I had nothing outside of my, you know, immediate uh, experience, right? I had no experience outside. How did the bigger world look at what it is I was responsible for doing? I had no clue. <clears throat> like all my training, all my education came up through the Chicago Fire Department, which is all fine and good, but it's also very limiting. Right. So, so it was real local. And you needed a little bit more. I, I needed a little more breadth and depth to how I understood my role. So I know you're the president, but I think it was established last night or maybe before that Seth is actually the alpha leader of this group. He's, <laughs> pretty a big much. He's, he's, he's a pretty big guy. Yeah. He's a real he's big, big deal. He's a big deal. He's a big damn deal. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're here in Denver <laughs> in West Metro. Big shout out to West Metro. This is one of the nicest. So let me back up a little bit. So we've all been around the country collectively seen a bunch of nice training centers, a bunch of great guys. Would I be wrong in saying this is one of the nicest centers ever and some of the best people to help work yeah, with? Yeah, it's Disneyland. It's, yeah, it sure. is. It, it's, it's unreal. It's unreal. My goodness. Well, they got a, they got a guy. Uh, this is his only job, right? I mean, it's the <laughs> service is to be the, 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 the custodian. The, 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 uh, the, yeah, the custodian. Yeah. I mean, he's. That's amazing. And it was halfway through the day that I realized that he wasn't a firefighter. The way he handles himself, the way he talks about the things. He's about he, to become. Yeah, he's credentialed. Not, yeah, right. he's right. credentialed, but he, yeah, he just hasn't yet landed the job. You and Chief Matt Hopple took a class that we already had and changed it, right? And added more to it, made it a little bit more current. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I don't want to take all the credit for that. What we did was we this class has morphed from our fall conferences where we developed a good hands-on training package. So we'd do one day of classroom and one day of hands-on training. And those that hands-on training package looked like very similar to what this class is today, where we had a lot of live fire, a lot of flow pass studying, a lot of transitional or exterior water applications and water mapping and just understanding the skills that go behind um, fighting fires intelligently and using the, the current science in the streets, so to speak. So that deliverable from our fall conference was very easily transformed into this basement hot training that we're supplying here at West Metro for the first time. And with the help of all these guys in this room of creating all these stations and then just transferring those same strategies, tactics, and skills to basement fires with using the current science and research from UL. Okay, so you're talking about UL. Uh, let, let me ask you, Mr. Van Dorp, President Van Dorp, what is the connection to the society and the UL NIST studies? And so, that? yeah, the society has been working with the Underwriter Laboratories, Firefighter Safety Research Institute, pretty much from its inception, um, try, trying to better understand the work. And part of the mission of the UL FSRI is to bring the science to the street. 
right? Is, is, and that's why whenever you all does a research project, the fire service is literally sitting at that table, um, helping design those experiments and then deciding what the deliverables should be, right? There's a technical panel that's involved in every one of those um, experiments and research projects that, that writes the technical report, writes the tactical recommendations. And then the society found an opportunity to help supplant that and by developing first off was PMFA principles of modern fire attack is to take those lessons and incorporate them into a lesson plan that can get that science, get that education, get that information to the firefighter at the street level so that they can make use of it. And that's what this basement fire project is a continuation of that effort. So we've been making that effort. PMFA goes back to almost 2013. It's still available through the society. Um, we have a, a regular uh, classroom basement fire class. UL has developed an online basement fire class that is part of the prerequisite for taking this hands-on class. And now we've developed through another AFG grant this, this hands-on class. And again, to try to get, uh, to facilitate this implementation of the UL work and other, pro you know, mostly the UL work, but other, other groups as well. And to, to facilitate the implementation of that onto the fire ground so firefighters can make use of it. Yeah, I think an important piece to add too is with these grants, the tech panel is a really important piece because it's a crosswalk of the fire service. So it's volunteer, combination paid, suburban, urban, metro, rural fire departments, all coming up with recommendations of how we want to fight fire, how we want to do this in best practices. We trans translate that to UL. UL comes up with a study. It's important that UL is... Well, they're the third party testing. So it's not just ISFSI saying this is how we, you should do it based on what we think is best. We actually have the science behind it to support these strategies and tactics. So it's not like UL NIST is just doing something, then we just kind of snag it from we're going to put it's a, it's a hand in glove kind of 100%. Kind of, okay. Absolutely. We, we make a, a really big effort yeah. to make sure that we don't misinterpret anything. Right. So, so everything gets washed through after we've put it together and we put our lesson plan together, we, we bring it back to you all and say, we haven't made any mistakes here. Have we? And, and they wash it again to make sure that, that we've got it online. And I know it doesn't mean we're without flaw, but we're taking every step we can take to make sure that those research lessons are delivered as accurately as possible. I think that really changes the landscape of the modern fire service has in the past and has continued to do so. Uh, the fire behavior class and everything moving forward. The 1403 class, sure. which uh, a little biased, I think it's a great class. Tomorrow's a big day. Tomorrow's the kickoff for this. We've been here at this uh, fire department all day long, getting set up, going over what our plan was, and our plans changed a little bit, maybe changed back. Uh, tell me about what's going to happen in the very first part, the fire dynamics lab. So the fire dynamics lab is right out of the UL boot camp, and so it's showing uh, real experiments that the students can get their hands on and burn some stuff and do some flow path tests and do some candle experiments. So we can translate those exact experiments to fire behavior that we're going to see in the afternoon. Um, we hand over the, the curriculum to the student, show them the supply package so they can bring it back to their fire department pay it forward to other organizations around them so that we set them up for success on the instructor level. Yeah, these are tabletop scale. Things, right. So we're trying to get it outside of the textbook, outside of the PowerPoint, onto a tabletop scale, sort of hands on. You can watch it. You can manipulate it. You know, we all understand we learn better that way and then make that tie. We're trying to retie all the fire behavior that we all learned since we came on the job, tie it back into the actions on the fire ground, because we think that's where things kind of broke apart a little bit over the years as we set, let those things separate and we shouldn't sure we should bring them back together. I think it's excellent too. They're going to start out their day with this, and then as they go through the different stations, they're going to apply the things that you showed them. That's I the think idea. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because there's a lot of misconception out there about uh, firefighting and science. <laughs> I mean, there's depends on who you talk to that, uh, that whether they believe you know science or not. You know, I don't believe that. You don't miss stuff. Nah, nah, nah. Push water all the time. The interesting thing about science is is that it's true whether you believe it or not. So yeah, you know. So you you don't think it's flat Earth. Yeah, uh, I, I do. I believe in all of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're, all, we're all good. And, and really, it, it's not, you know, part of it is to, to demystify all that. We, because no, nobody at UL is trying to tell you how to put out fires. You know how to put out fires. And when I say we at UL, I happen to sit on their board. Uh, and it's just the advisory board. And so I, it, I'm not doing the work. They are doing the work. But the work that they're doing is to try to empower you to be able to make better decisions on the fire ground. That's it. Not telling you this is the better way or that's the better way. But we can we can provide you, they can provide you with information and understanding 
that you could spend your entire lifetime trying to get through experience. You're going to run out of career before you have enough experience to learn what you can learn through the UL work. And that's what it's there for, is to help you make the best use of your experience. Not specific tactics, or you have to take this back to your fire department. You have, you've you been doing it wrong this whole time. You have to do what the society says. Nobody, but nobody there's a lot of things. has ever said anything remotely like that. There's yeah. a lot of things that validate what we've been doing, too. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right? It I tells think that's us, just as important, right? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. So as much as it's changed the fire service, it's also validated it. So after the fire lab, we go to our first station. So who's in charge of our first station? one because we're, we're everybody you know yeah, they, yeah. They wrote so, let, so let's let's start with uh, uh tc to bc from dc okay. and gilbert tell me a little bit about what they can expect when they when they leave the dyna fire dynamics lab and then they come over to you all so uh the uh main goal i think that we've what we've got a lot from the ul stuff is uh water on the fire as soon as possible um basement fires uh present with uh, with some tough access issues right um so we've got a couple, we got a station set up with, uh, with that. We have a limited access where maybe there's some basement windows that present to the outside. So we're gonna show you with techniques to, to use, uh, get water into the, into the basement through those windows. Then again, the, we know that in order, for, for, in order to extinguish the fire, we have to go inside. So um, while after we, we can knock down fire from the window, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go in and, and do do some interior water and go down the interior steps to extinguish the fire. So our station will give you uh, the ability to, to to practice putting water from the outside and also to to make a push down the interior stairs. Another important part of our station is uh, is doing a, a full three hundred and sixty and making sure that that's complete. Looking at the access points, looking at smoke conditions coming from the vent ports, you know, whether it's a window or the seams, look at the conditions of the door, what kind of smoke are you getting out of the door and uh, make your decisions and judgment based off of the conditions that you see and try to use, you know, thermal imager, get your best way, um, you know, where's the fire located? Recognizing that it's a basement fire and then basing your tactics off of that. We, we have it set up where my job, we have it set up where we get companies in the front and the rear pretty quick. Right. But if there's a delay, um, we want that officer, the first arriving officer, to get a view before they commit yeah. the resources. Sure. So in a lot of your urban, especially in older urban areas, you have access problems just getting to the back of the building. I mean, you have forcible entry issues that will delay you getting to the back of the building. So you have to modify this 360 idea. Um, one of the things that we talk about in this class and just in general is 360 isn't necessarily a lap around the building. Right? It's, it's what you learn about all sides. It's getting eyes on all sides of the building and communicating that information to each other. So skin that cat the best, the fastest way you can skin that cat. By positioning. It's yes. positioning correctly. Well, however you need to do it at home. That's that's the part that, you know, that is up to you, not up to us, right? We're emphasizing the importance of doing so and the critical thing that can be missed by not doing so. Right? We're trying to emphasize if you if you convince yourself that that's not necessary this time, you're probably going to pay for it, you know, and, and it's worth investing the time. Yeah, basing your success on lack of failure. You know, just because yeah. it's gone right forever and ever and ever. Sure. Then, yeah, it's very so it works perfectly for me. Right. Well, it brings up that old, uh, you know, mantra that, a uh, you know, a problem well stated is half solved, right? Right. If you commit yeah. to the wrong side, uh, things are going to be delayed, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the first mm -hmm. few minutes of any fire, basement or otherwise, sets the tone all the way down the road. Sure. So it's really important to get that, uh, that that good look at it and know what you're dealing with. Now, Gilbert, you work with Tony in this particular station. What What's the equipment you're using downstairs in the morning? So in the morning, just to save, um, you know, be, getting people dirty, um, what we're using is these fire panels developed by Lion, right? Um, and they're digital fire panels, and uh, they're actually really, really cool. It'll glow up the entire room, and it looks like fire as you're coming down the stairs. It has crackling sounds. Combine that um, with smoke if you would like to, and you get full simulation, and it looks like there's, there's actual fire. So um, our goal is for people to recognize that there's a fire. They can visually see a glow from the corner from those basement windows, um, direct a stream using some of the techniques that they'll be learning at the other stations. And then uh, once they got that fire knocked down, go back and make that push, just as Tony was saying, down the interior stairwell. And as you're coming down, you could see and hear that glow continue to happen. 
apply water directly on those panels and um, based on the sensitivity of the panels, it'll be a, a tough fight or it'll be an easy fight. Uh, yeah, the, the first time I saw them in person was today and I'm really impressed with those things. Uh, and uh, you, can, you, you hear fire sounds and you can change, the, like I said, the sensitivity, how much fire is there. They're pretty impressive. But so I'm, I might be bugging you tomorrow and see how well they work. The nice thing too about those panels is it's is not just the not getting dirty part, but that you get the, the students actually have the ability to see what right looks like in a safe setting, right? So in the afternoon, we're obviously gonna change to the live fire setting. So in the morning in that station, they're building what right looks like. So in the afternoon under, you know, life, under, you know, ideal age conditions, right gets applied. So we're building the right skill in the morning to apply it into an ideal age environment in the afternoon. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so we leave that, we go over to the dollhouse burn. Now, this dollhouse burn isn't like every other dollhouse burn I've seen uh, on, on, any, on the YouTubes. So what's different about your all's dollhouse burn? Yeah, this uh, <clears throat> it's a new model. Uh, the, the good folks in Billings uh, put it together, and it, it's supposed to be a representation of uh, uh, the actual full-scale uh, you know, uh, lightning lab that was uh, produced out, out east. And what that gives us the ability to do is instead of, you know, as everybody who's going through this course has got a, a whole bunch of pre-course work that they have to do. Uh, they watch a lot of videos. They, you know, have got all the research and the science in front of them there. This gives them the chance to, to look at it on a small scale. And you know, like the other uh, dollhouse that we created as part of the Principles of Modern Fire Behavior, the original class, uh, this gives us the ability to reproduce some of those conditions in the small scale. So, uh, by manipulating the doors, uh, we've got a single story ranch with a full basement, uh, interior stairway, uh, a couple of exterior windows and doors that we can demonstrate some different, uh, uh, you know, air airflow uh, from no airflow, you know, in a no access situation to a whole lot of airflow. And we can move the fire, you know, literally throughout the house in, in any way that we want. And uh, uh, it really creates some excellent uh, fire behavior. All, all of the terms and things that we've learned so far, the, the flow pads, the, the different types of, you know, temperature uh, transfer, you know, through the house and the way heat moves through the house, all of those things are illustrated. And it's really a fun, you know, uh, you know one that every every fire department, I think, can build and and, and really impress upon their, their, their firefighters the importance of, of how this, uh, this content in this course can save lives. I really like how you can, after the fire, you can take the first story off and look down in and see exactly what happened. I think it's a great teaching point. Um, I'll, I'll just throw in and, and add a little to that is that, uh, as Forrest said today, when we were doing our demo burn, you know, everyone is different. So based on wind conditions, right. based on the fuel, based on all of that, it changes. So it really reinforces those higher level thinking skills, being able to synthesize and take a look at the smoke, take a look at the vents figure out what's going on. And so when you get to work with a pro like Forrest, um, he's really, really good at uh, capturing the moment and, and, yeah. and capitalizing on that. Those dollhouses are one of the biggest takeaways, I think, from this class and when we did PMFA as well, is that they're simple to build, they're simple to use. And once you get comfortable, it's something that you can use back at home that everybody can make use of. And the more burns you get, the better you get at manipulating stuff and the more you get out of them. And, and we hope to get some really good fire dynamics to play out you never know because wind conditions and all that but the bigger part of the lesson is we give you the lesson plan they're simple to build take go home build these things and use them back home that's, the that's one of the coolest thing about all the classes really is there's so much information given the student and we encourage them to take everything a, is take a share take you a can share. do this back home absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we go from the dollhouse straight into water mapping so we're looking at the, the UL study on water mapping and where our water actually goes. So we're going to talk to them about that, how it travels across the ceiling, um, how we can use the lintel or the king stud to break up the stream and to actually get water into the fire. We look at different types of nozzles, um, air entrainment with uh, fog nozzles and even smoothbore nozzles. Um, and kind of, you know, look at all aspects of that. And, and if you think about when you went through fire streams, we never talked about any of that stuff. We never talked about where the water went. You know, you may have been taught the O, the T, or the Z, but it never really was like, you know, hey, where, how's your water, you know, really being distributed in the structure? And, you know, the UL fire attack study, I think, opened uh, some uh, some eyes on that. It surprised a lot of the researchers doing the study. It's a real testament to them is because they thought the water was going in a very different direction than it actually is in different situations. And so they've learned a lot there that they 
sent out to the fire service. Yeah, it surprised me too. When for this class, uh, we all had a uh, we had train the trainer webinars. We had all kinds of stuff we had to do to even get to the point we're at today. And that was one of the things that really surprised me. It was the water mapping. I don't know if you're trying to get out of talking there, sir, Brad. <laughs> Tell me what I found really cool is when when, when you guys did the uh, solid or straight stream and the fog, and then you have these uh, streamers hanging down. And it explains the or shows the air train. But tell me a little about that. Yeah. So uh, one of the one of the really important things for people to keep in mind is is when we're talking about streams, and particularly in the setting of this conversation, if we're talking about any exterior stream application, it's really really critical to be cognizant of what that exterior water application may or may not do to the remaining areas of the structure, and we want to try to minimize that impact. Um, of, of, of any kind of product combustion or anything like that going elsewhere in the structure. And so the way in which we fashion that stream for that exterior water application is absolutely critical. And, and it, there's, while a lot of the, while a lot of the UL uh, studies have shown that there's tremendous value in, in rapid water on the fire, even if that means immediately from the exterior, and we've kind of gotten the green light to be able to do that from a tactical standpoint, with that has to come the education that there's a right and a wrong way to do that. And, and, and that's really the key takeaway of that, uh, of a portion of that station is to show them that we need to be on a straight stream and not on a fog stream and try to be up close to the window and not far away from the window and not whip the stream all around in a rapid fashion and keep it a little bit more um, straight on because all of those things doing them wrong can entrain air. And so by hanging those streamers um, from a doorway that comes off of that water application area, you can really paint the picture with your students that, hey, we want to we want to be able to apply water in an effective way directly on the space where we want it while minimizing the impact on anywhere else in the structure. And we can really illustrate that well um, just simply by changing stream patterns and, and, and altering a few different things while the students watch what the air does with those streamers that are going um, to we, what would be representative of the common hallway um, that additional rooms come off of in a house. And then the other portion of that station um, is, is uh, some of the through the floor nozzles and the options for uh, the ability to apply water through a floor, maybe from, for example, just inside the threshold of a door, being able to, to, to cut a small hole and send a Bresnan distributor down, or being able to pound a, a piercing nozzle through the floor from some type of an exterior access point and showing the students what that flow looks like. Those, I, we talk about it all the time, those Bresnan distributors, for example, or seller nozzles, sometimes just sit on the truck for years and nobody ever gets them out and plays with them and really puts eyes on what that stream looks like when it comes out. And, and most importantly, when you're using those devices, they're designed very specifically to not only be able to distribute water in a horizontal fashion effectively, but also be able to throw some water back in a vertical direction, um, which really coats the underside of that burning, uh, uh, you know, coats the underside of that first floor or basement ceiling. And that's really a critical point too, as well, when you start to talk about um, you know, the, the possibility of failure of the ceiling as the fire progresses and things like that. So um, the other piece of that station is really showing them some of the streams that they don't normally see from devices that they don't normally get a chance to use. And, and I really think that's one of the most important pieces to that station, because you think about it, most of these guys have never seen one of these. So now we're going to let them see what it's doing. So now it's going to kind of open up their mind the next time they have a fire is, hey, this is another tactical option we have. Yeah, today you all uh, demonstrated for all of us and you, you did the piercing, the resin, and then the fog. And I really liked because it was outside and you could really get an idea of the spread of all, all of those. Now, if you're a department that have a piercing nozzle or you don't have uh, a resin, you know, at least you, you could still use a fog, but to your point, you're not really getting up into the uh, structure, uh, up above it, basically. So you're doing the thermal imaging station. First of all, we get to work with you, which is fantastic. Right. And, so, and can we put it on, for everybody to know, for the rest of life, it's going to be on the internet, that my ears do not stick out from the side of my head very much. 
<laughs> normal size ears. Did you say that? Absolutely it's normal. I mean, okay. There's a reason I'm behind the camera. Yeah. <laughs> they would see. <laughs> I would you, I don't, what's the burn <clears throat> percentage on your ears? <laughs> Funny story. I did get burned on my ears, and my lovely brothers in, in Lexington drew a picture, and they got, I think it was 19 and 32. Because yeah. you got sun on those things are burnt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they absorb all the heat. These will get burned, but my face will be fine. It's like radiators. They're perfect. So tell me a little bit about your station, our station. So, so together we're going to teach uh, thermal imaging. And so basically the, the premise of our station is to kind of get people to be more of a thermal image operator than just an end user. So teaching them what the uh, kind of the functionality is with a the thermal imager. So, you know, obviously these thermal imagers showed up on our trucks. And for the most part, it was just put on the trucks with a lot of departments and said, hey, just start using your thermal imager with minimal to little training. Um, so our goal is to provide both functional, you know, skill sets through a live fire environment as well as a cold exercises. And uh, one of the cool things is with all these is, you know, I come from the show me state. So the things we're going to do in this whole eight hour program is prove to you, let you do it so that you can be shown that this actually does work. And so, you know, for us, we're going to do cold exercises. Where we're going to actually get the thermal imager out. You're going to use it. You're going to walk with it. You're going to see how important it is to go back to your basic skills of crawling uh, when there is smoke um, and the limitations of a thermal imager um, in a cold environment, safe environment, which we teach those skills that you can take back to your company level, right? So all those things can be done on that crappy Tuesday afternoon where you're like, we got nothing to do. We're we'll great for thermal imagers. We're going to do some training. And then the other part of that station is going to be a live fire. So we're going to actually set a fire outside and then what we're going to do is we're going to show, you know, conduction, convection and radiant heat and how those patterns uh, move. Uh, they're always coexisting at the same time, but how they kind of uh, exhibit themselves in a thermal imager. And then we're actually going to show you uh, a floor. Uh, we've knocked up a bit of a floor pattern with some carpet and show you kind of how heat doesn't necessarily transfer like we would think um, through a thermal imager and what a thermal imager actually sees. Um, in terms of that. So kind of, you know, if we were crawling over that proverbial basement, right? Um, what that thermal imager signature might look like or may not look like. Um, and we'll do some masking drills and things like that as well. But uh, again, you know, the cool thing that I really think the cool thing at all these stations, but especially the thermal imager station is that those are skill sets and training nuggets, if you will, that you can take right back to your department and implement tomorrow um, to improve the safety of your firefighters. I agree. I think people get these uh, ticks on their rig and they think it's as simple as turning it on. And then how, they never think about how to hold it, when, you know, when to use it, none of that stuff. They just, well, I've got it. I'm safe. And I think I, I personally think that some people give up some of their basic skills because they think this replaces it. A tick doesn't replace your search skills at all. It's just to enhance it. Uh, I've done training where, you know, someone's doing a search and rescue with it. And then I'll just grab the tick out of their hand and go, OK, your battery went dead. You know, where are you? You know, they got to stay oriented. And I think that's really important, uh, an important thing to get across. So we've gone through all of our stations. It's a busy day. I don't have any doubt that it's, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be a whole lot of fun for us and the students. But we do wrap up with a nice live fire. So Seth, would you mind telling us about the big, big bonanza at the end? Yeah, sure. So it's a, it's a very well thought out live fire event where we have four simultaneous stations going on at the same time. So our students are gonna be rotating through those four stations and I'll let the instructors talk about each one of those stations. But basically it's trying to get a, as many sets and reps through a live fire event as we can safely and put all of these practices that we're instituting in the morning and actually apply them to real fire in the afternoon, just like Brian said. So really excited, I think it's very successful in the past and it's gonna be very successful tomorrow as far as getting students right up and close to the fire and really having a lot of fun with it. I look forward to it. I know, so me and uh, Brian, we're going to be doing tick again during this one big exercise. Me and him will be having a group, we'll walk around and talk more about the thermal imaging camera, what to look for, how to look for stuff. And then we have a backup line. We have Kaz doing RIT, and they also get a little bonus because you got some extra information to tell your RIT people, right? Yeah, so not only will we look at RIT, but we're, we're going to look at some of maybe the fallacies of RIT, some of the skills that we teach that maybe aren't so realistic in the real world. Um, and then actually look at some line of duty deaths and, you know, different rescue opportunities and that. So I'm a big believer in learning from those that have gone before us. So I think we personally owe it to them to learn, learn you know, how to prevent it. Well, if anybody's listening to my podcast, they hear me say almost every time a firefighter's blood isn't free. It's our responsibility to learn from that. So we, that you don't have to have the same thing happen twice. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's part of the, the I, I love doing this. And, and I, I love every day of my career. I often say, you know, I, let me tell you about the worst day, my worst day in the fire department. It was fantastic. 
I mean, that's the kind of job we have. Even your worst day is fantastic, but there, there are some buts. And, and, and one of the buts is to this day, Dan Madrakowski still has to send out emails that say Cherry Road all over again. Yeah. And Cherry Road happened how long ago? 1998. Okay. Decades ago. And we're making the same mistakes. Um, and, and so you, you, you see that we're talking about a lot of things that aren't about basement fires per se, right? It's not about that push down the stairs. Um, there's so much more to it. If you're not good with your thermal imager and you don't know how to use it on the exterior to gather information, if you're not serious about your 360s and what's the critical information you've got to get and communicate, um, if you don't understand where your water does and doesn't go, um, you can't use that line effectively. All these things come into play, right? So that we can stop having cherry, in this particular case, we can stop having cherry roads all over again. Good call. Uh, so, so let's talk about that push down the steps, right? Because yeah. because um, there is going to be that scenario where there's no access from the outside. So fortunately, what we've learned is that the basement fire isn't going to be firing on all cylinders with no ventilation. Right. So perhaps the push down the step won't be as bad, but in the chance that it will, you got a hose line. You have the tools in your hand to help you make that push. So I, as a chief in, in my department, one of the things that I did was I'm not going to make, I'm not going to let it be their first time that they make the push down the steps the day they have that fire. And that's what this is, is we don't want them to go, wait for a fire to happen to be able to, oh, let me try this push. Now we're going to do it here. And we're going to try and get everybody that's that's here, 40 people if they show up, and have them make a push down the steps. Because that's that's the worst case scenario, right, is making that push down the steps. Which, but we're going to do it. Which leads me to you and Gilbert now have probably the most fun in the, in the live fire tomorrow. As you're taking the oh, guys in, in and out, well, in and out. It's going to be tough, I think. I, I don't know that, uh... <laughs> you, you know, there's, there's a, a, a little, uh, I guess, war story. You know, we taught this class in Tinley Park a couple of years ago, and a friend of mine, you know, retired out of the Chicago Fire Department 30 some years, came to me last week and said, Hey, listen, I just used that push down the stairs technique and it worked. You know, so here, and his, old, his exact comment was, You can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> So here you have a very experienced guy, retired as a chief from Chicago, working in a smaller department now, and was able to use this and say how well the push down the stairs worked. And what's the two things firefighters hate the most? Change, change. and no change. The way we'll change are. the way things are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to wrap up here by thanking all, all you guys being on my podcast. I really believe in this program. I believe in the ISFSI. I can't say that enough. Uh, I think I personally have met some of the best instructors through the ISFSI. No, honestly, I'll kidding aside, I, th I think it's a great program. And I, I really want people to research the society. You know, it's it's not gonna cost a million dollars to go to class. It doesn't cost a million dollars to join. You get a network of brothers and sisters that will allow, it, allow you to not reinvent the wheel. If you got, if I've got a search and rescue planned uh, training, I, I call Seth. You know, I want to call people I've done. I call Gilbert. You know, it's a great network. It's an excellent, excellent uh, fraternity of brothers and sisters. I can't say enough good things about it. I appreciate your all's time. And it is almost time to eat. Okay. I know not to keep firefighters from eating. That's that's not a good thing. So thank you, brothers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. I spent four days with these great instructors teaching a fantastic class. Now, like all society classes, not all of these ideas and techniques may work for you in your department but it is an excellent place to start to make you and your department better. I'll put a link to the ISFSI in my description. Remember, stay safe and have fun. It is the best job in the world. 